Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic D Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Eden Foods, the most trusted name in certified organic clean food. When you shop online at EdenFoods.com, enter the coupon code ORGVIEW to receive 20% off any regularly priced items, excluding cases. For other promotional offers, please visit TheOrganicView.com's website. And don't forget to check out our contest section. There have been numerous studies about neonicotinoids which have been criticized because of the perimeters used. On today's show, Dr. Christopher Connolly from the University of Dundee is going to discuss the difference between field studies versus laboratory studies when it comes to research on neonicotinoids. First, I'd like to welcome to the show my co-host, Colorado beekeeper Tom Theobald. Good afternoon, Tom. Well, good afternoon, June. We're heading into a cool period and hopefully some rain after a long, long hot spell. Thank you, Tom. And our guest today, Dr. Christopher Connolly. Dr. Connolly, welcome back to the show. So great to have you. Hi, thank you very much for the invitation. We have plenty of rain here if you need some. (laughs) We always need some, but I don't think we want that much. (laughs) Dr. Connolly, could you please take a moment and share with our listeners a little bit about your research? Okay, so I've been conducting laboratory experiments on the nicotinoids on honeybees and bumblebees. Um, and so we, with our collaborators, we've built a, a very robust evidence that the neonicotinoids at field relevant doses, this is what bees would feed on in the wild, uh, around 2.5 parts per billion, actually does things at several levels. In my lab, we looked at individual brain cells and we could see that the brain cells uh, became dysfunctional by neonicotinoids very quickly. We then looked at how the whole brain function worked and the, the brain circuits were not working properly. Our collaborators at Newcastle, Geraldine Knight, looked at individual bees and they found, as you'd expect from this brain funk dysfunction, the bees couldn't learn and couldn't remember very well. Then taking the studies to a colony level using bumblebees, you know, we and uh, our collaborators have, have fed or provided neonicotinoids to bumblebees over five to six weeks and found that the colonies performed very poorly on neonicotinoids um, compared to control. So all of the evidence from the individual brain cell where the neonicotinoid works, all the way up to the whole colony, how it affects, we have very robust evidence to prove that neonicotinoids have a seriously negative effect on the bumblebees. The problem is that most governments do not accept laboratory studies despite the fact that these are performed under very carefully controlled conditions, so we know that the effects that we see are a result of the neonicotinoids, we can make a cause and effect relationship. Despite this, governments insist that only studies done on large scale in a field um, are relevant and should be considered for evidence when deciding whether they're safe or not. And of course, the only people that can afford to do these large field trials or industry, or scientists funded by industry. So doesn't it almost appear as though they're setting up the research to fail? Well, the interesting thing is, if if I were given a huge amount of money to uh, do field trials, and if half of it were to be used to prove that neonicotinoids were safe, and the other half was to used to prove they were uh, deadly, I could generate the data. The reason for this is that because the neonicotinoids work on the brain, they make their learning and memory faulty. They can't forage for food efficiently. So actually, they become stupid. Um, Now, if you take a stupid person and you put them, surround them by food, then they won't starve. If you take a stupid person and make them go and find their own food, then they'll, they'll have trouble. But the same will occur with bees. So if I design my field study so that, for example... I placed my bees on a crop with neonicotinoid treatment for two to three weeks, and then I removed them to a a pristine wilderness military site where there are no chemicals have ever used, and there's an enormous variety of wild forage for the bees to have, Um, and so it's easy. 
so th that way the, the bees would be able to um, slowly recover from the toxicity of the neonicotinoids and during that period they wouldn't have to work hard to find food because it would be easy and they could then recover so i could design my experiment that way and i'm sure i will show that that's not a problem however in the real world this doesn't happen real bees real wild insects live in one place so if they get exposed to the neonicotinoid then when the crop goes the neonicotinoids actually moves through the soil and poisons the wildflowers around the crops the hedgerows the trees and these all produce flower and pollen which the, the bees can then collect so actually the the toxicity continues for long term when if you stay in this area it doesn't go away with the crop and these bees will not do well and actually beekeepers in the uk see this so beekeepers in, in the intensively arable areas are having real problems whereas beekeepers live in more remote areas sometimes take their bees to canola, which is neonicotinoid treated for a couple of weeks, then take them back home where there's very few pesticides and they find no problems. People in the arable areas are having terrible problems. So I could design the two field trials to give me the two opposite ends. But of course, the one where you stay put is the field relevant one because the pesticides are staying in the soil. Dr. Dr. Connolly, as you're talking, I'm thinking, and I'm thinking what you're describing is virtually the entire United States has been poisoned by these neonicotinoids, and the likelihood is long term. Uh, but what I'm thinking is I'm finding it interesting that the regulatory system and the powers that be have have uh, set standards that can only be met by organizations with unlimited power and resources and and money. Uh, isn't that curious that they've really stacked the deck against the independent researchers and ultimately I don't think it's going to make any difference what the research says. The research has spoken largely and the largest field trial we have is, again, the entire United States and the fate of commercial beekeepers over the past 15 years. These are beekeepers who've many of whom have been beekeepers all their lives and represent the second, third, and fourth generation of beekeeping families. We've seen a disaster in this community, and that's the greatest field trial of all. I don't mean to discourage what you're doing, but I think we need to start looking at the source of these problems, not simply the consequences. Well, I think you're right. The source of it are hundreds of pesticides that are being used and we don't we don't track we don't track when they're being used we don't know who uses which pesticides at the same time you know um, pesticide cocktails could add new forms of toxicity we don't even know about yet we know this in medicine because many old people who are on 12 to 20 medications quite often have new problems that are generated by so many medications interacting in unforeseen ways so, of course, the same thing will happen with pesticides out in the fields. Um, but the neonicotinoids in particular, several there have been several field trials that have been um, contaminated by neonicotinoids that weren't part of the field trial. So they might have looked at clothinidine and found that there was loads of thiamethoxam there, even though it shouldn't have been. This indicates the level of contamination that we have that's constantly around. And so... It means that any field trial that you do, you can never be sure what is causing any effect. And you don't know what's, what other toxins are present, what other diseases are present, and what other mitigation factors that might actually compensate for toxicity might be present. So it's a very one, of the things, one of the things that I've seen in some of the recent studies is the inability to find a control location. Exactly. You can't do a control. And even supposing in this fantasy world that you could find a control, your field conditions that you do your experiment on will not be the same as other field conditions. They vary so much. So therefore, the relevance would only be to that very narrow point. Um, so actually, the whole point of doing a field trials for this, I think, is totally pointless. You know, the laboratory's controlled studies can tell you that this compound can cause this effect um, at this level for this long and if the field chemistry tells you it is there for this period of time and the bees feed at this level what more evidence do you really need 
beekeepers can attest to this because they see the bees every every day over periods of years and we can see what's going on we may not be able to characterize it scientifically but we can see what's happening and we know that there's a failure to thrive and a high loss and loss of queens and all those things that the research is beginning to to show us um but the reality is i don't discourage the resource but i think we need to take a good hard look at what has brought us to this disaster and begin to change some of the management of this situation because i will speak for the working beekeepers we are out here dying and we can't last much longer we need to all begin to undo this gordian knot or we're going to be gone well um I don't want to say anything against beekeepers, but actually this problem is much bigger than just beekeepers' problems and honey. This is about pollination. It's even much bigger than just about pollination. If the bees and other insect pollinators don't pollinate all our food, it's extremely unlikely that we can feed the 7.4 billion people that we have on the planet. That's rising by three people every second. So that's a major issue. But even beyond that, even if the human race were to die out, the, the, if the, the bees actually provide the ecosystem services, they fertilize the plants, the wildflowers, the trees, the hedgerows that all the other animals live on. So actually the entire ecosystem would start to break down. And that's really even more serious than a, a beekeeper problem. Not, I'm just trying to say that isn't, that isn't enough. The bees are the smoke alarm. The bees are the miner's canary. They're telling us something and we need to start listening. Well, if you take a look at the film More Than Honey, which came out in 2013, the producer of the film, Marcus Imhoof, did a fantastic job demonstrating what the world would be like if this happens across the globe. There's a section in China where this is evident. They, the bees cannot thrive there, and they have to hand pollinate. And I remember when I asked him, I said, well, what if that were to happen here in the United States? And he said, by the time that they collected and distributed the pollen, it would be too late. They would not be able to pollinate all the crops that they need to in order to continue to feed the people as they have been. No, absolutely. It's it's an enormous task. If you think about the almond um, crops in California. I don't know how many thousands of people that you'd have to bring in because all the pollination would have to be done within, you know, like a week or so. So, yeah, you, you cannot replace um, the bees. And if you bear in mind that it's it's not a single species, so we can't rely on just the honeybee. We need the other, we need the beetles, we need the honey, bumblebees, and we need the hoverflies. Because it's been shown that it's not just the quality, but also the quantity of crops are improved if multiple different pollinators visit. So we need to also be, bear in mind that it's extremely dangerous to put all our eggs in one basket. So if we rely entirely on the honeybee, that would be really dangerous because we we can't afford to lose the other pollinators. So bear in mind that our honeybees are under enormous stress because of because 30, 30 to 70 percent of U.S. colonies die each year. 44, I think, percent last year. That means bees have to be brought in to replace them. With this, unfortunately, comes new diseases and parasites. And so you've ended up with the varroa mite, the same as us. Um, so this single species of honeybee is under enormous strain. I wouldn't want to put all my eggs in that particular basket because we can't. No, I think I think the honeybee is the poster child of this dilemma. And the the thing that distinguishes the honeybee is they have mentors. They have beekeepers and they have people that will speak out for them, but there are thousands of insects that are being as dramatically affected by this environmental poisoning that have no one to speak for them. So the bees are the smoke alarm, as I say, and we need to start paying attention. And I think the only way we're going to change this is to start changing the leadership, the management. These are management decisions that are being made. And for example, over here in the USA, the EPA, at least in the pesticide arena, the Office of Pesticide Programs, has become a marketing agent for the chemical companies. They don't do much regulating. 
they do a lot of posturing, but uh, we wouldn't be facing this disaster if they had been on the job, and they haven't been. It, it is a, a bizarre situation where the safety and efficacy of a uh, pesticide, so how good does the neonicotinoid work? What's, what, how good is it for my crop? What's the, what's the increased yield I get or the decreased failures? And also, what's the damage? All of this evidence is provided by the producer, the industry itself. And also, this data is all confidential. So we can't even see it. And well, so the, the system, the system is, is constructed to promote the continuation of these criminal activities. It is striking that once the research has been done, not only do we discover that the neonicotinoids are proving to be toxic to bees, but even worse and more insulting than that is they're not even efficacious for farmers. They're not improving yeah. yields. So why are we poisoning our bees when it's not even helping our crops? It's stupid. Well, because this is marketing and salesmanship, not agronomy. This is That's business. The, there are billions to be made on these products, regardless of what the consequences may be. Yes, that would be the cynical explanation. The only one explanation you can think of is why would you do it? is because of the financial income, the taxes. How else oh, would you justify it? You I can't. can't. You I can't. can't. Well, Dr. Connolly, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. It's always great to hear from you. Thank you very much. Dr. Connolly, thank you for everything you're doing. And don't stop. Keep doing it. We have to do the research just as we've done. And, and I encourage that. Thanks, Tom. Good luck. And folks, please check out the companion article, which will appear on theorganicview.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon.